Hello and welcome to Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a psychological astrologer and I have the great pleasure of David Alkington's company today. Welcome, David. Hello and thanks very much for, for spending some time with me. Well, you know, I, I've been reading your wonderful book and here it is. It, it's... Um, I suppose by modern standards, a bit of a tome, but oh my goodness, what a tome. It's called The Ancient Language of Sacred Sound, The Acoustic Science of the Divine. And as I've been reading it, what struck me was the amount of technical detail that's there. And the, the way in which you, you describe everything very meticulously. And then, of course, I realize that you are a Capricorn. And what else would a Capricorn do? So you have the Sun, Venus, and Mars all in the sign of Capricorn. And Capricorn is very deliberate in the way that it does things. It thinks things through very carefully and takes time. And just leading up to our conversation um you were talking about wishing you'd had more time to write i i suspect that many a capricorn who's written books has said exactly that because there's it seems that there's never enough time to go into the careful detail that a capricorn would like to go into does that sound about right yeah i'd, I'd say it sounds about spot on Although I'd make one observation about myself. Um, my mother had the misfortune of giving birth to me during one of the great winter crises in the early 60s and um, slipped over in the snow. So I, I, I actually arrived a month early. So my description of myself astrologically is that I am an induced Aquarius <laughs> or an induced Capricorn, you know? <laughs> so so I always feel an affinity with both signs. Um, but when I see the the, the um, star sign for Capricorn for the goat, um, it's always walking uphill. And sometimes writing books is a bit like sort of, you know, the uphill struggle to get to the summit and then whoopie do, you've got the view all around you. And from there on in, it's just a slalom downwards, isn't it? Well, it's, there's a, a couple of things that you mentioned there, which I think are, are interesting. The first was you, you were talking about feeling like an induced Aquarius. Yes. You know, you have got Mercury and the Moon and Jupiter and Saturn all in Aquarius also. So mm. it, your, your chart, most things are either in Capricorn or Aquarius. It, mm. One or the other. And, and I think that's very interesting that you, that's your, your feeling when you describe yourself. Yes, yeah, absolutely, it is. Um, and I kind of feel, you know, I feel okay about it now in later life, but in earlier life, it was, um, it was a struggle, definitely. But then gradually, you know, it's calmed down. And now I'm used to being this kind of writer who has to sit on his rear end all day, just using his brain. Um, but, you know, when I was younger, I had a lot of energy, a lot of physical energy. I wanted to get up and go places and do things. And tallying that with then having to sit down with all of your mountains of research to put it into a book, that's the painful bit. Because you've got to tell the body to say, hey, calm down, just chill out. We're going to just spend eight months writing a book now. You know, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's an odd one. It's a, it's a very odd one. But the achievement of having done it is, it's, it's a nice feeling, I have to say. You also, you talked about the goat going up the mountain. Well, the Capricorn is only half the goat because the other half is the fish's tail. So it begins life in the sea mm. and makes its mm. way onto shore. Yeah. And I think that's very relevant because most of the time people talk about the goat and they talk about, you know, Capricorn ambition and, and that side of Capricorn. But the goat is not a Capricorn. It's own, Capricorn is only half goat. And the fish's tail, I think, is the interesting thing here for you. 
because it emerges from water and water is the element that we associate with the more mystical side of human experience. And this book is all about mysticism. In the, well, it's it's about the science almost of mysticism, if I can put it that way. Yes. Which yes. Is a wonderful merging, really, of the water element, the earth element of Capricorn, and then the intellectual side as well of mm. the of, of Aquarius, which is air. And I think particularly what strikes me is the, the second part to your title, the acoustic science of the divine. And science is very much something that we associate with Aquarius, the interest in knowing how the science works. And I think technology you know, comes, plays a very um, important part in, in, your, in your book. It does. I, I, I wanted to quantify what these extraordinary places are truly about, um, because they're much maligned places as well. The, the, the reason being that science today is so specialised that it, 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 it rarely steps back to give itself an overview of the whole. And as a result of that, what is missing from the approach of science is that that wholeness that tells us in what direction we're heading, who we are in association with the places around us. And I also felt very strongly that the, the Gothic cathedrals, the pyramids and temples and stupas, they've not been given enough credit um, in terms of the way we have developed as human beings within a, a, an organized society. Um, that has actually arisen around these places. So the whole idea was to investigate um, the impetus behind them. Why did we build them? And of course, the more I asked that question, the more I came up with what I thought were some rather astonishing answers, actually, which are backed up by um, a considerable amount of hard evidence. Um, which is why the book went into detail, because I wanted to make sure that the, the thesis was truly, well and truly nailed down. You also have, we were talking about how many planets you've got in Capricorn and Aquarius, and almost all of the ones that we've, I've mentioned, with the exception of Jupiter, the others are all in the sixth house. And the sixth house is about routine. And I think that it would be a very important part of your, routine would, would be play a very important part in the way in which you organize yourself in order to be able to do the research and then write. Would that, would that be true? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're kind of on a, on a pilgrimage and you have to kind of get yourself into the mode and getting yourself into the mode means being like a pilgrim and when the pilgrim approaches this sacred building you have to walk a spiral an ever decreasing spiral around it to approach it and then enter into it um, and of course the point at which we end that spiral and then we go into the building that point is called the entrance which if we pronounce it properly is entrance so you are entranced by the journey. Every morning I have a joke with myself that, you know, I go out, I do the washing up, I, I clean the house, I, I, I sort out my notes and I gradually approach my desk slowly because I'm finding distraction techniques, but I'm approaching it in an ever decreasing spiral. And eventually I sit down and boom, I'm there, it happens, you know, so that's definitely me. You mentioned um, towards the beginning of our conversation um, how much you like, particularly when you were younger, to be physically active. Well, your, your rising sign is actually Leo. And that's, you know, it's all about fire. And I think it's, it's action, it's inspiration, 
it's it's having fun and i i suspect that as a child you probably did have quite a bit of fun um despite being a capricorn there's something here about being a special child you know there's something about your birth that's that's important so what what was it what was important about your birth um that's a seriously good question i i don't know to be honest with you um all i can say is that um my father and i were agreed when i eventually i began to wake up to the world around me you know that that period that happens in your early teens that that i definitely felt that i was on a path somewhere and i had something to do uh and that's always been a very strong um internal feeling um to the degree where if i don't pursue it i feel bad about not doing it it's almost like abandoning the mission so so that's quite strong within me but what the actual points of my birth is in terms of its meaning i've no idea i've no idea at all actually so when you were born was there much excitement within the family were you the first the last the only boy was there anything around around your birth in that sense i was the first um uh and i was the only the only chap um and um uh i mean <laughs> I, I can tell you a very funny story, actually, because um, when my my mother and father had just been to see my my father's mother, my my grandmother, and uh, it was a very serious snowstorm, and uh, just outside the station, she fell over into the into the side of the road, and my father, bending over to pick her up, start, suddenly started laughing, and he picked her up, and she'd gone into labour, and uh, she said to him. For goodness sake get me to a hospital and she said by the way what are you what are you laughing at he said well look at the drain cover and it said elkington and son he said i know it's going to be a boy you see because my family were silversmiths and metal workers from from the deep early 19th century and um so i i always say that i came from the gutter um <laughs> but but it's it's a very telling story in that way you know so it is telling story because there you are there's the the quintessential leo ascendant experience um you were one of a kind in your family and the first which does make you special mm. to the family um now the other thing you were talking about which is more about having a sense of purpose a sense that there's something that you're here to achieve i think that's to do with the north node in leo in that first house so from an early age you would have had this sense that you're here to do something. I'm not quite sure what it is, but you better get on and find out what it is because you're here to do something. And, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, you need to stand out for it. And I think, I've, so I looked at your midheaven um, to see, get a sense of, you know, career. And it's in Aries. Um, so archetypally, you would expect somebody to be involved in, um, in sports, in something very competitive, to be a, an entrepreneur of sorts. Um, but it could also be somebody who's on an adventure. And you, you know all about, you know, the hero's quest, which we associate with the sign of Leo. And then we have, you know, the warrior, um, the airy side. So I imagine then that this would mean that at times there's a little bit of controversy as well. Oh, lots. Absolutely. And I don't shy away from it because it seems to me that we live in such tumultuous times that we need a bit of truth. Uh, and in, in order to find out why we're in this, we are seeking to move to the future, but we cannot until we've looked to the past. And so if you're looking to the past to look for the key to the future, then the truth is the great vein running through that particular cheese. And it seems to me that today we need to kind of confront some of those truths um, in order to move forward, because we've become slack, we've become very polarized today, and there's really no reason for it. It seems to me that we're living at the end of an age, and that this new beginning, this beginning of a new kind of period of time, needs to refresh us and to renew our sense of adventure of who we are 
and to give us a new kind of motivation in a sense. So if I can help towards that and do my small bit, then, then fine. One of the things that I truly valued about your book, and there are several, but one of them um, is the, the way in which you explain the inexplicable. So the very things that science is, has been very sniffy about and dismissive of, and actually downright hostile to, are things that you've been investigating. And here you have the scientific reasoning for why so many of these things actually are real and work. And I love that. I love that because sometimes when I'm listening to the different arguments and you hear, you know, um, you hear scientists, you know, in, in search or physicists mm -hmm. talking about the theory of everything. Well, hello, that's just modern language for something that we've been trying as human beings to do for centuries, but from a religious perspective. And it's, and it's so often I hear it and I, I'm thinking just a different language, folks. You're both wanting the same thing. <laughs> can we, you know, can we just have something in the middle here? We are, we are we've, we've definitely changed our language. You're quite right. Um, Max Planck, the great um, physicist and quantum theorist said many decades ago about the quest to co-join the very big gravity with the very small quanta. He said, we'll never be able to bring those two together. We'll never find an answer until we start looking at the idea of consciousness, yes. which in a, in a spiritual sense is where we're headed. Um, and it seems to me that Having, I'm, I'm working on a book at the moment about the origins of Christianity through some discoveries I've made. And I'm looking at the theology of, of the early Christian church. It talks about angelic hierarchies. And that, that's an idea that goes all the way back to the early days of ancient Egypt. And the more you look at these hierarchies, and then you put them against what we've discovered about the, the minutiae of quantum particles, the more they seem to be one and the same thing. And it's the most extraordinary thing. And you think, gosh, you know, consciousness is perhaps energy. What is energy? We don't know. All we can describe is how energy comes in packets and what those packets look like, i.e. leptons, hadrons, quarks, atoms, and you name it. But we don't actually know what the energy is itself. But when you look at the angelic hierarchies, you're rising through the stages of heaven and you're, you're making the approach, the ultimate approach to the divine, but you never quite get there. So we are of God because we contain the energy to be what we are, uh, physical, intellectual, mental, emotional beings. We know that God resides inside us, perhaps it's consciousness, but we can never get to understand and be consciousness or be the energy that we actually contain. And I find that fascinating because you're absolutely right. That is um, how our language has changed, but the quest remains the same. Indeed, and I think the language has to change, has had to change, because our the way in which science has informed our culture has changed our perspective perspective of the world to a much more materialist perspective. But that has well, it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as they say, because it's, it's a paradigm which the language reflects, but because of that, we've stopped being able to speak an ancient language, which already had many truths within it, if that I makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, a lot of that's down to um, the late 19th, early 20th centuries, when we, we had two forms of science. You had uh, pure science, uh, which was about investigating whatever you wanted to investigate just for the sake of it. So you had that kind of Victorian adventurous quality of, right, I'm really interested in where we come from, how we, you know, are we related to, to, to animals and other things? So we developed the idea of natural selection evolution. That's pure science. But then there's the other side of science, which is applied science. 
which is we're going to make things for a purpose. And now there is no pure science. It's all applied science. If you want to go to university and study science, you've got to study a science and it's got to be for a reason. So you can enter either academe or industry. And it, there's nothing more depressing than when you hear about a new breakthrough like the Higgs boson of a few years ago. Fantastic um, uh, accomplishment. And what's the first thing the, the, the Americans and the British want to do with it? They want to turn it into a weapon. You know, it's just, it's just really, um, that, that to me is the epitome of the materialistic approach of applied science. And the more we take that view, the less uh, um, connected we are to what science truly is. I mean, look, science in its Latin, scientia, means knowledge. But it's how we apply that knowledge. And it seems to me that we're lacking the wisdom now to understand the gadgets that we are creating um, to the point now where we're actually now inventing um, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, but we don't have the intelligence yet to approach that with wisdom. Because so we're, what we're going to do in, in, with the artificial intelligence is we're going to give it all of our bad habits and the result could well be tragic. And a couple of weeks ago, I read a couple of articles um, Two of these Alexa contraptions you get from Amazon were put in a room together and they were left to talk to each other. Within six hours, they were talking about the complete destruction and annihilation of the human race. And a number of scientists have done this across the planet with exactly the same result. Now, if you're telling me that that's not worrying, then bye bye. <laughs> because yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary that we are allowing this to happen um, and we just think it's terribly funny. No, well one thing I would say listening to you coming back to your chart is that I'm hearing I'm hearing the Capricorn and the Aquarius very very clearly because the Aquarius has that interest in technology and Capricorn is saying whoa hang on a minute do you remember Pandora's box? We need to be very careful here. And, mm. and you mentioned wisdom, which is the very, very thing that makes, makes humanity most dangerous. We have all the intelligence. We have all the curiosity. But without the wisdom to temper it, we get ourselves into deep trouble. And so it's lovely to have voices like yours. And having had a look at your chart, I can begin to get a sense of why you sound the way you do. So thank you so much, David, for speaking to us on Life Astrologer today. Thank you very much indeed for having me. That was truly fascinating. And the book we've been discussing is The Ancient Language of Sacred Sound, The Acoustic Science of the Divine. I'm going to be sure to put that uh, a link to that on the description box. David, if people wanted to write to you, contact you, how could they do that? They can do that through my email address if, they, if they'd like to, to do so. Um, they can get in touch with me direct at um, the following email, which is Elkington, E-L-K-I-N-G-T-O-N-7, uh, the figure seven, at iCloud.com. And I'll put that on the description box as well. Thank you so much, David. You're really welcome. And thank you all for joining us and um, watching. Do be sure to subscribe and like the, um, the interview if you've enjoyed it. Also, feel free to ask any questions uh, of an astrological nature. And I always read the comments and do reply. Until next time, goodbye.